Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're back in session. Uh, now we're coming to an exciting part of our program, which is an open discussion. Um, 10 years uh, after the MOOC, it's not exactly 10 years, it's maybe more. Uh, we can discuss exact timelines in a moment. Um, it's quite exciting because we all are more or less students of the MOOC. We've all engaged with it. It's now uh, there's a core of it that is uh, very strong and enduring, uh, but it's also uh, dated in some ways. Uh, and as Perry said in previous uh, sessions, uh, a lot of work has gone into the money view uh, since the MOOC was uh, published. Um, so with that, I would like to now actually invite Perry to the stage to uh, give us some input about where the MOOC is. Um, is uh, from his view uh, today, uh, but more importantly, um, there might be already a slight preview of his next book project, which we've teased uh, all of you in the program um, about a little bit as well. So Perry, uh, what are you thinking about? What are you working on? Uh, what is this book project about? Uh, let me share my screen and I will tell you. Um, so, Um, I am uh, uh, tentatively thinking of the next book being called something like How Does Money Work? Um, although during during our fireside chat with Katerina, she was talking about capitalist law. Uh, maybe I should call it capitalist money or something like that. Um, the uh, But that that uh, I had prepared these slides before that. So um, it this is a tentative working working title. And the idea sort of is to build on the MOOC, to take the substance of the MOOC, but to all of the stuff that I've learned in the last 10 years, um, the timing, as you say, it was actually the fall of 2012 when the MOOC was filmed. Um, so it is longer than 10 years, but it was the fall of 2013 when it was first shown on Coursera. It took us a year to do the, the get the paperwork and to do all the editing of the of the film and stuff like that. So um, it is a little bit more than 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 10 years, but not but not I was dating it from when it actually went live on Coursera. Um, and uh, so uh, there are, uh, and as as um, as Alex was mentioning, there was a, an, another update. The Warsaw lectures were intended to be an update in I think two thousand five or two thousand six or something, and um, so but was it okay? So there was that was meant to be a little bit of an update. Um, but I am thinking about create, and those are videos. So I am thinking about creating an actual book for ten years. People have been saying it would be useful to have a book that you could assign to students and use as a textbook, or maybe just read or something. Um, that that wading through twenty four, you know, video lectures, twenty two video lectures. Um, is quite a commitment, um, and it takes time in the way that people people can sometimes take in information faster from a book. So people have been asking for this, so I'm thinking about uh, uh, writing a book. Um, and let me just remind you, this is how the MOOC was organized. Um, it's 22 lectures, um, the and they were in these sections, um, and they they it focused on they were organized around the four prices of money, as I called, except that I didn't deal with the fourth price, um, and it was an upper level lecture for economics majors. Um, it's there is a book that has this frame, which is New Lombard Street, and some people do when they need to reference something in their papers, they and they feel like they can't reference. A Coursera, you know, a set of videos they reference New Lombard Street. Um, the certainly the analytical, you can see that New Lombard Street came out at the same time as the MOOC was being made, really, and so it's the, it's the same point of view. Um, but you notice how I, I, the way I was thinking about the course originally was sort of, you know, an introduction, you know, introduce people to some economic history and some balance sheets, and then two ideas: payment system, market making system. Market making system is the trader model. Payment system is the survival constraint about settlement, um, and using those to talk about the first two prices. Then a midterm. That's what I do in in when face to face. And then really just applications of this framework, I thought of it, uh, to in extensions to international, extensions to capital markets. Um, and uh, so uh, that's how it, and then I had two wind-up lectures, one about shadow banking, um, that was because of the financial crisis, um, was it on everybody's mind, and then one, well, where does this fit with standard economics? That's how I 
did it. Now here, just I'm gonna I'm just gonna put my bottom line first. This is my working outline for the next book. Okay, and you you can see there in basically what I call chapters three and four. What I am one I am now thinking that I want a chapter about the payment system um, or a section about the payment system, the settlement constraint, in which we talk about domestic and foreign settlement in the same time. You know, instead of waiting, so that we get global. We get a global conception of the world from the beginning, and I'm thinking of of the dealer model that we're going to we're going to do capital markets and money markets, so interest rates and swaps, you know, at the same time, not not uh, not sequentially. So it's not an application, it, and it's we're thinking about money markets and capital markets in the same. And then I think about adding substantively the 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 fourth price of money. So that's what I was trying out on you guys, you know, on 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 Friday. And then applying some of that to debates about monetary policy and backstops and so forth. Um, that's the core of it. But the and 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 you can see the things in in red are kind of new. But I'm also thinking about creating a, more stuff before and after framing, which is chapter one, global money, um, and chapter two, financial society, chapter seven. Um, other applications, crypto, CCP, China, debt sustainability, war finance, for example, um, and extensions, balance sheet mechanics, the kind of thing that Chris was showing, or 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 Bojas, or what history, law, political economy. I'm going to talk about why all of this. What I really would, could use today from you is some feedback, you know, about that. What what maybe you would like? What, where I am not particularly thinking of this as a as something that's going to teach you to think about the world in balance sheets it's more social theory really um 30, feet kind of thing but maybe that's not the kind of book that i should be writing anyway that's how i was thinking of it so let me just say a little bit why the place i started and i and i want you to think about this and give me your honest answer um which of the lectures did students like the most what i when i was teaching it at, at columbia I really thought they really liked the repo lecture for for some reasons. Um, they really liked the world that Badgett knew. Well, that was the first time in the class when the, it kind of all the pieces came together, and they really liked the market for liquidity, the trainer model, that stuff. So those I thought, and and when I but when I offered that idea to my uh, BU class, they said, no, those aren't the most interesting lectures. The most interesting ones are because they are international relations majors, so that's why it's in red, are chartalism and metalism, chapters 13 and 14, and, and they're interested in the problems of, of development finance, so the direct and indirect finance, those chapters, and, they're, and they were quite interested in the, in the sense in which this is a uh, an alternative to standard economics or something. Um, and Maybe you will tell me in the when we we you know so think about what you think are the most important or most interesting lectures that would be useful feedback for me. There's stuff that's happened in the world in the last ten years, um, and uh, these are two BIS diagrams just to just to that I use in lectures all the time. One is showing the uh, the expansion of the of the of the of the shadow banking system basically to the global south, the ability of global south to tap dollar dollar capital markets um and which is incomplete as we were as we were just hearing from the previous paper but but uh and that this is a it's part of the global financial cycle um that you're seeing so when the dollar is weak credit is expanding to the to the emerging market economies and when the dollar is strong the reverse um that's one thing and then you can see in the other one this is the this is the mechanics of the covid what happened during covid when when the banking system froze up for a while but it, the liquidity swaps kicked in right away and and basically stabilized the price of these fx swaps this is sort of at the top of the system, right? These are FX swaps with the yen, with 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 the pound, um, with Swiss franc, with the euro. Um, so there there is an active FX swap market there, um, as opposed to at the with the with the emerging market. So those these are new things that in the last ten years. I also this is a list of all the stuff things that I've published in the last ten years. So uh, on central banking, on capital markets, on extending the money view to the global market. This most recent book, these things are not in the MOOC because they came after. So um, they could be resources. 
And in particular, um, I want to draw your attention. I've been thinking a lot about um, where the money view fits with standard economics. Why is economics the way it is, and uh, and 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 therefore, how how do I engage with that? Okay, I was trying to develop the MOOC very much in a way that would be just orthogonal to standard economics so that I wasn't fighting with anybody. Okay. I was just introducing stuff that that nobody knew about at all. Okay. So that it it, it was not it was not fighting with anybody. But I'm inclined now maybe to fight with some people. And so I uh and that makes me try to think, well what do we have to fight about? Um and some of these all these papers are kind of in that vein you know, thinking about the evolution of of economics from a tale of two cities. This is the rise of modern finances about Marshak, um, the monetary economics of Benjamin Graham, the proposals for commodity reserve currency. This is the history of the of the MIT economics department, which became the leading the leading economics department in the world. There's a kind of history of where financial economics came from, uh, the monetary education of John Hicks. So this was the early Hicks and the late Hicks. Uh, and then after Money and Empire, these three papers, which are just now fresh on my website, um, Minsky Kindleberger Connection, Badget, which you heard yesterday, um, and Key Currency View, um, why is it a minority view? That's really what 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 that last paper is about. So I've been so that's other stuff to think about. So here's some guiding ideas. Um, Al Alex was in my class, uh, so he's seen some of this, but other, but others of you haven't. And I've actually changed this around. I've thought about it more than than since then. Um, I think that I'm guiding ideas for restructuring. It seems to me important, and this is when how I teach today these days is that I start with this idea: Why is money difficult? Okay, that alchemy, instability, hierarchy, hybridity. These are four ideas that well-trained economists have a hard time with. Okay, because for for particular reasons, and so bringing them up to consciousness at the very beginning is a way of of of, of telling people what what where we're going that's going to be different. Um, and uh, the you know alchemy seems to break to break the uh, no free lunch idea. You know instability is not equilibrium. Hierarchy. You know most most economic theory the world is flat. You know and hybridity. You know public and private that that contested space tends not to you tend not to see that in standard economics. So I also want to shift. I do think that the MOOC is excessively American, um, and so I want to shift what I treated in the MOOC as as applications um, to the initial framing, so that we're global from the beginning. You know, from page one, you know, we're not extending to international. It starts with international. That it's a a key currency dollar system. Both their own. There's one money market in the world, and there's one capital market in the world, um, and they're dollar capital markets and dollar money markets, and everyone taps into that sometimes indirectly in their own currencies, but there's arbitrage be between those. Okay, and similarly, that the global the the, the global banking system is essentially a market based credit system, um, shadow banking system, money market funding of capital market lending. Um, that in the very beginning, okay, so that we're not spending time with, you know, standard banks or something, that we put that at the very beginning instead of an application at the end of the class. Um, I think there are a couple of new ideas that that were in the MOOC, but not fully developed. This particularly most important is this distinction between payment and funding, which is sort of hinted at in the MOOC, but not really developed. Flux and reflux, money funding and capital funding. You know, these these I think are very central uh, analytical ideas that are not in the MOOC. Okay, similar. I should also say they're the fourth price of money, also not in the MOOC. So the I I want to put those in a central place. And instead of focusing on the particular instruments that that came, because I was really trying to translate Stigum into economics, um, I would I would say let's just start with the concepts. Let's think about global money market and global capital market. Those are my guiding ideas, which may be correct or maybe not correct. That's where I'm starting anyway. And I want to bring the controversy. As I say, maybe pick some fights a little bit, or or make clearer which fights I'm picking because I was always picking fights, but I was trying not to get waylaid by them um, by by focusing on the positive contribution that the money view 
helps you see things that you can't see with standard with standard approaches. Um, I think that to make that even clearer, it might be a better to tell people what do you see okay that the that they that when you think about the world in a money view way ISLM seems not very helpful to you in DSGE models seem not very helpful to you um the trip and dilemma flex the Mundell Fleming trilem all of these things are are viewed in a more critical light I think when you are coming from a money view so make that clearer than I, I wasn't really engaging with that because I didn't want to fight with people when I wasn't quite sure what I believed yet, you know, so let me work it out first. Okay. So revisionist fundamentals, revisionist history of the dollar system. So I've been, I've actually been giving this talk versus the Bretton Woods myth of multilateralism versus the Westphalian myth of the nation state, um, the key currency view putting much more centrally um, and also engaging with the, with other critics of orthodoxy, you know, which I don't mention at all in the MOOC, you know, and so people have always wondered, what is the money view connection to critical macro finance or to the circuitists in, in France and Italy or to MMT or to stock flow consistent? And so I have views on all of those, but I haven't actually written it down anywhere. Um, if Dan is here, he will remember that he tried to get uh, money view talking to all of these groups. We had a little conference. Um, actually, I think it was in 2012, in the fall of 2012. At the same time, I was creating the MOOC. It was in it was in uh, it was in Canada, um, and when we got representatives from all of these groups, and we tried to see if there was commonality, and it basically didn't go ever anywhere. Nobody wanted to work together. Um, so, uh, but uh, and but I wrote a paper for them and to try to engage with them. And so I think that might be useful also for the, to, to do that more deliberately in this, in this new book. Um, I'm also looking at the MOOC now, since I've gone through it carefully, and I realize that it sort of is an accretion of my own intellectual journey in maybe not the best pedagogy. Some of this came from the history of ideas that I was learning from, from people who are no longer alive. Um, and, and, uh, some of it was coming from my experience, you know, during the 20 years when I was teaching this stuff was an evolution of banking, the the death of banking, people sometimes called it the birth of shadow banking, um, you know, the rise of DSGE, the, the re change in financial regulation, the Basel capital regulation, all that stuff, which I'm, I was watching, and that was influencing what I was doing. Um, and I think now I need to, I, in that, and, and of course, the course was developing being revised a little bit every year, but it retains, it's sort of a palimpsest. It retains shadows of things that are 20 years old in there. And I think we should start from clean slate. Um, I also, having taught the MOOC now, um, it seems very clear to me that lectures 18 to 21 are were my attempts to engage finance. I was writing the book on Fisher Black at, ex at that time too. And so they're very financy, okay? They're not so money viewy. Okay, and those those lectures, um, and they need to be reworked. I think also the chapters on foreign exchange it is too complicated, um, and it needs to be reworked. But that's those are going so those th that will be enabled by putting them right next to the chapters on FX, on right next to the chapters on par, you know, and putting the capital market stuff right next to the chapters on 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 money markets. Um, so I think that will be and, and making more clear that liquidity not solvency is the lens for everything adding options dynamic hedging is the way to bring i think options into the story thinking about the that that analogy um in and uh, and and why why you know that that involves cash flows if you're doing dynamic hedging whereas um the the uh, black schultz formula doesn't sort of show that but implementing it as a dynamic hedge would show the cash flow implications um so here i'm going back to remind you that of the of my tentative outline um and uh so that you can sort of see where, why I'm doing, why I'm proposing this, that it is a way of starting with global money. It's a st way, financial society, this is a way of, of, of also saying this is sort of social science in a way. Um, and, uh, 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 and then some applications at, at the end and, and pointing to the kind of stuff that, that people hear on the, on, on the Money View Symposium, where they've taken the Money View, not so much that I have anything to contribute, but pointing to it and saying, here's what other people have done. Um, 
I've actually written about crypto stuff. I've written about, uh, or I'm thinking about it, CCP stuff, China stuff, debt sustainability stuff, war finance stuff. So those are my applications, but extensions are sort of other people's applications, I guess. Um, so now I, so that's the the last, I just want to show you to, to just maybe spark off some discussion that I gathered together a bunch of images Okay, <laughs> that I have find myself using repeatedly when I'm asked to give talks, um, which I which I'm thinking would also be useful to have in a book, you know, as illustrations or images. So I'll just flip through some of them to remind you. Um, the first one Jay chose as the most useful when he was the very opening of the of this whole conference. Um, um, Eli Para's translation of my financialization and discontents into this nice little. Uh, institutions of financial society of money, finance, and banking. Um, that's, I think, an, a very useful image. I use I use it too. So I uh, uh, approve of that. This one I use more frequently too to say, well, what are capital flows for? Distinguishing between short-term capital flows, which are about payments, really. They're buffers and balance of payments, uh, borrowing in the international money system. It's not entirely true. They might be about funding if you're doing money funding of capital market lending. Um, but long-term capital flows um, are about uh, the young debtor. This is Kindleberger here, young debtor. It's it's about the global ecosystem and different countries at different stages in their development are going to be in different places in the in the sources and uses diagram. Um, net borrowers, net repairs, whatever. I think that's this is another image that I use often for students to get them. Here, the hierarchy, it's not just the hierarchy of money, but the hierarchy of hybridity, okay, that that the global dollar is is a private dollar, largely, it's it's an offshore dollar. Um, and as you go down the hierarchy, it becomes more public, so that the less financial developed you are, the more likely you are that the central bank and the treasury are the same thing. Um, and, uh, and there's sort of layers, it's a it's a four layer system. Um, at least. And each of these layers faces a different problem confronting the global system. Um, the central bank faces a different problem. You can see the central bank's managing the overnight interest rates or the spread against the dollar rate or their general interface with the global system, or they're really not all that integrated because they don't have much of a financial system. Um, hierarchy of hybridity. Here's the here's the one that I used when I give my little talk about revisionist economic history, where you have the standard idea that life begins with Bretton Woods versus the key currency idea that that the dollar system is taking over from the sterling system um, and it is being driven sort of by bank bank developments. Um, and it's pre-World War II, in fact. Um, the important thing are, are about capital flows, not IMF, which was about restoring multilateral trade. Anyway, so it's a different... It's a different chronology, a different way of understanding um, the evolution of the international monetary system, um, and a different analytical frame, um, too, uh, for thinking of key currency arising from practice, not from political logic. Um, this is another thing I use in any economic theory. So I, I was saying confront Triffin, confront the, the flexible exchange folks, confront the trilemma, um, and confront the new international economic order idea too um, from the global south. Um, and uh, as Kindleberger did himself, um, here's another image. So this is the three trainer diagram that I used to talk about monetary policy um, and uh, which you've seen in chapter, um, it's, it's lecture 12, um, where the, the Fed is controlling the overnight rate and that then get translates into asset prices. Um, uh, further down, um, and uh, and you, uh, I should augment that, I guess, with the new the new diagram about commodity dealers too, um, which I don't have in this slide yes, yet. Um, the geography of dollar funding. So this is my attempt to uh, to move into the money view. The the findings of Aldisor and Ehlers, the geography of dollar funding, the globalization of the shadow banking system. Um, in a way with emerging markets, borrowing in, in global markets and then funding in money markets in the global north. Um, I use this, the dealer of last resort that is supporting this global shadow banking system um, through the liquidity swaps between the Fed, the Bank of Japan, the ECB. I use this one. Um, lender of last resort um, that emerged from not just the, not just the, uh, 
2008, but in fact from the COVID crisis too, where the Fed is is at, at is providing backstops at different degrees to different parts of the system, um, full backstop of all layers. Um, of the system in the United States, more backstop in the global north, less backstop in the global south, but some backstop everywhere, you know, overnight payment system, more or less everywhere. Um, and so those are, that's my attempt to kind of spark some conversation. Um, and uh, I would, so, so I remind you, um, I'm interested to know what your, what, what is your favorite lecture in the MOOC? Um, you, if, you, if you're here, it's because you like the MOOC, I guess. So there must be something. What do you like? You know, what would you uh, and and what was causing trouble? I know some of the things that caused trouble because Alex has told me because he's been teaching the MOOC. So I I've been listening to that and and trying to think about what I what I can do. So let me stop here and and hear from from you all. Great. Thank you, Perry. Uh, we'll go right to the comments. Jorge uh, has his hand up. So, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I can't remember uh, what was the lecture, but I think it was something about credit card payments. It might be something else. That's but lecture remember. four. Okay. That's what, what, that's what Chris Reamer was, th those things. He was he was translating that into his graphical apparatus, but that's that's all from lecture four. Yeah. Okay, and maybe there was another one with a similar mechanic in which you had a bunch of balance sheets, and the thing was incomplete until the end, and then the last instrument that you would place in the final balance you would connect back to the first one. I found that kind of uh, diagrams okay. flows very very useful. Okay. Keep going. Um, you asked which um, um, which parts you found most we found most useful, and um, I was I, I'm starting with the ones which I think you put down as the ones at Columbia, meaning um, the parts where you talk about the repo, the trainer model, and so forth. I thought were uh, most useful when I took the MOOC ten years ago, and um, I just want to point out that um, I think. When it comes to the framing at the end, and when you start, when you wrote down uh, these other components and CCP, of course, sprang sprang mm -hmm. into my face. And um, that's just to reiterate that um, people like Steigerwald could be, for example, uh, collaborators on anything on that. And then um, a question: You said that the book, um, and maybe I misunderstood it, but you said the book was sort of meant to provide a um a social theory could you elaborate on that that's it uh um Chris, yeah let me I, I will i will i will let me just take a note of that and i will say something about that maybe later mm -hmm. okay um Chris, not Chris, if you'd like to go or should we do people who have their hands up in that case salim salim you go first uh, I have just recently uh, completed your uh, more course on Coursera, uh, and it is I have uh, seen these videos multiple times. Uh, I love this lecture because uh, as a standard economics, I am doing PhD, and here in uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, Pakistan Institute of Development is just uh, uh, very good in standard economics. But uh, when we are discussing nowadays the, in conferences about how to Pakistan develop. Uh, your uh, lecture on development uh, that, that there is a, there is a long term funding is the, the key to develop these uh, developing nation is never discussing anywhere in Pakistan. So when I ask question like this, they they confused that how they uh, answer because there is n not involved in the book. So it's clear my mind that how we can develop. Uh, it's not our domestic policies. It is the funding that how we can get this long term funding and we can uh, build on it and then we can uh, do uh, a bit track on the development. So the, uh, the, the development lecture I like very much and also the foreign exchange because uh, in Pakistan, the state bank is the market maker. So when we're discussing the exchange rates, 
So we never seen that how uh, this market is operating. So from your inside and uh, outside uh, uh, theory uh, backstopping, I just uh, uh, understand that how the state bank is making market in Pakistan and there is no private making and uh, no inside market making. So uh, uh, I, I just uh, uh, said that this few two lecture is, uh, although all lectures are very good and I have learned a lot from it, but these two has changed my view about how to economics working. Thank you. Great. So we have m four more at least. Do you want to keep going or do you want to start? Yeah, keep going, you? please, please. Okay, Mohammed is next. Hi, everyone, and uh, sorry for not being on camera today. I have uh, two questions, but a disclaimer first, which is that I'm new to all of this. I haven't, I started taking the course on Coursera a long time ago, but then I paused. Um, uh, so but I hope that I will be able to continue very soon. Um, I have two questions. One is about um, the relationship to um, what Perry is interested in and critical thought in general. And he mentioned that he's interested in having uh, some sort of like general uh, social theory. So I'm interested to know more about like how connections can be made between uh, the money view and um, critical theory in general, or um, like I noticed and heard over the past two days, uh, many ideas about uh, anti-hegemony and all that. So I I would love to see that more explicit. And um, also uh, maybe this would be something that would be part of the fight that uh, Perry wants to have. Um, the other point or the other question um, is what Perry mentioned about starting with the global um, and uh, I am thinking about if we start with the global um, it, I, I have a concern which is that um, and I, I, I don't know much about that but I have a concern about uh, whether this might give the impression that access to the international or the global market is equal or it's also hierarchical and um and therefore like are we uh, and this is something that we see a lot in trade economics imagining the world as like one big uh market so thinking about starting with the global that create the miss uh, or like the impression the notion that access to uh global markets is equal or uh, whereas uh, it's still hierarchical. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good point. Alfredo? Um, yes, so <clears throat> I, I teach macroeconomics here in Argentina, and uh, I try to, to teach like a, a, an alternative uh, to the orthodoxy, and I use the money view uh, in the initial lectures when, when I try to put the like the micro foundations to to study macroeconomics and um, and in that sense uh, I cannot say which is the, the the most interesting lecture I would say all <laughs> but uh, but what I I, I met uh, with my my students is uh, that I didn't find for example maybe I'm wrong but but uh, I didn't find for example um, uh, in 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 these slides that you use in the MOOC, um, the like interbank payments or when when some an a firm one transfers money to enterprise two, and they have different banks, so then these banks they have to pay each other through uh, central bank deposits. That example, I think it's it's very useful. To uh, for for students to understand more the basic thing and understanding, for example, why uh, banks have uh, central bank deposits. And um, I can uh, share <laughs> some of my uh, uh, slides that I use when teaching. Uh, th this is one. Sorry for I mean it's I I, I should uh, modernize or make it digital, but but it's hand by hand. Um, so this was like bank deposit transfers involved interbank payments. 
commercial banks pay each other with their deposits at the central bank. I think that is quite important. And, and it's and not so much in the MOOC you find, because uh, I teach that stuff when I teach it too, you know, so I may also have followed you in doing more of that than is in the MOOC. Yeah. Ah, that, that, okay. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I didn't find, but maybe. Wait, in, it. Well, so Alex is reminding us that it is in fact in lecture five, which is, which is, I think the one about the Fed funds market. Um, and uh, which is about which the Fed funds market is an interbank market. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but it may be, but so that's not so much on the balance sheet of the Fed, partly because I, I used to assign the, um, you know, that, that Dunbar, um, which was about how payment system worked before the Fed. I found I found that very useful reading, so that students don't imagine that somehow a central bank is the Deus Ex Machina. It comes in and sort of solves all these problems. You know that there were payments before there were central banks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, uh, lecture five is uh, the one about uh, the central bank as a clearinghouse and as it a clearing with the idea of yeah. one big bank, and then you split it into multiple banks and yeah. how. Um, if firms deposit lecture it, six is fed funds exactly. and seven yeah. is repo yeah yeah and uh yeah so that all comes from dunbar kind of originally um i don't know do i do i still have dunbar reading in there it's in Maybe. the MOOC. Yeah. it is in the MOOC. okay yeah yeah uh, no and, and the second thing and, and with yes the, go ahead the, my la last comment is that i also uh i don't know I, I am microeconomist, so I'm interested in, in the money view, uh, as I said, like a micro foundation to build up and understand better microeconomics. So what I also use is, for example, this, this table that is saying that, in fact, I mean, credit money and investment, and it's saying that, well, ex ante saving is irrelevant for credit and investment, but deposit holding is key. So maybe it's an ex post saving. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to engage here yeah. with, with this investment equals to saving all. That yes, thing. exactly. And so that's what the funding versus payment is doing. So that that's not dealt with in the MOOC very much, very well, you know, but that is dealt with now, now with this issue that you can expand the balance sheet on both sides the flux you know but then there's a the question of funding you know is this money going to be staying in circulation or does it need to you know turn into someone holding an asset or something so i'm going to i'm i am doing that now that that is a that is a, a big weakness analytical weakness because that's the bridge to macro as you as you say exactly. yes, yeah yes. okay great yeah that's and it resolves these, if you, there, I have this paper, by the way, that's on my website, if you could want to use it now in your teaching, that okay. I did for, for Sheila Dow's Festschrift, would I sorted it all out, you know, because this is a problem for the post-Keynesians, right? There are many talking about the flux without the reflux, you know, and Keynes himself, I talk about the MMT, they talk about the flux without the reflux, really. And so it's, it is a deep problem, okay, in macroeconomics, and I wasn't clear about it in 2012. I hadn't sorted it out in my own mind. I had some intuitions about it, which were correct. Okay, but but I couldn't explain it. Now I have explained it. You know, in in and it took a, it was hard. People still find that paper quite difficult, as a matter of fact. Although it's just balance sheets, but that's because conceptually it's difficult. It's conceptually difficult, but it's vital. It's really central. So um, that that you you're putting you're pointing out. A failure of the MOOC that I was aware of. <laughs> yeah. Good. So who's next? So great. Uh, we have about fifteen minutes officially still in the session, and plenty of hands up. Uh, if you well, I want to listen hand... mostly. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have your hand up and you've spoken already, just put it back down so I know if it's a new question or not. Um, so I mean, I'm assuming it's a new question, um, but I think Diego is next, from what I can tell. Thank you, Jay. That's a new question. Um, well, um, Professor Perry, uh, my name is Diego Perez. I am a Peruvian economist. I'm in this. Uh, I've, I've been following the the meeting because of the MOOC and and your updates through Twitter. Uh, I want to I want to introduce myself. My school has a Eurocentric view. Um, that is to say that we. We learn economics by the European classic school of thought and also the neoclassical American school of thought, 
which includes obviously the Chicago Boys. Um, and your MOOC give me uh, first of all, I want to thank you for 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 the course and you know give us these uh, new ideas about how the money works. I'm still in the process to complete the the MOOC, but I'm I'm very grateful to to get in touch with it because I'm starting a startup in money management and it's really interesting to to know these concepts. So I feel that um, you are not trying to attack mainstream economics, but to clarify key concepts uh, such as the basic um, um, is, is I, I think it's basic to know for an economist to to know that price has two two four types actually, and you can introduce this to let's say a uh, um, classical school of thoughts or neoclassical and obviously it could stress is a stress test in the orthodox models that they have and probably banks are using um, you know your approach to <clears throat> to be more accountable so um trying to explain the the mechanics of how money works is i think it's really powerful for for an economist to know and this should be included in the in the syllabus for for everybody um for example just to give you a quick example is as a leading indicator for let's say the stock market after your i, I finished the seven lecture and it it's clear to me now that a leading indicator is uh, inventories and lending standards so um i i obviously will continue but Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'm glad to be, be here. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Who's next? Thank you as well. Uh, Yun Kim is next. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to see you guys here. Uh, I think I am the most uh, newest participant in this group. It's less than a month since I recognized the Professor Merlin on the book. Uh, it was fascinating. <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what's the shadow banking, but this book was the best place. What, the, what is shadow banking? Make me get a little understanding of that. Uh, even my name is Young. I'm not the youngest here. I might be the oldest here. <laughs> Uh, I'm approaching 72 this year. <laughs> so <clears throat> I, may, I may not fit to this group, but uh, I like to learn. And most of my audience uh, in Korea, I'm a Korean Canadian. So <clears throat> immigrated to Canada about 30 years ago. And <clears throat> I just want to learn and I'm an individual thinker and I'm writing on my individual personal <clears throat> blog. So most of my writings are in Korean, but I have some articles in English, but uh, because I'm not a scholar, I'm just a, a practitioner or <clears throat> just a thinker. Uh, it may not fit to the scholar's view, but <clears throat> And my topic, uh, my idea is mainly uh, focused on what should uh, the, the money should be, is the, the title of my blog. Focusing on rather than giant to Jolen. So uh, I was fascinated about the hierarchy of money but hierarchy, is it <clears throat> uh, coexist with the idea of the, we, the human dignity? Or we should respect to the <clears throat> sovereignty of every nation state. Sometimes this hierarchy kills people and kills nation. So, <clears throat> That's one of my questions. And the other one, yesterday I 
uh, was fascinated was that the the idea uh, liquidity no no the inventory should be positive should not be negative. How does it go with the naked short naked short? <clears throat> I guess there should be a negative inventory. Lots of negative inventory is there. So you should you should consider that. And also yeah, well, yes. So the the derivatives markets, you're talking about like uh forward markets where people are yes, you can get negative yes. That is so the physical you know, there's a physical limit in the cash market. Right, yeah. You can't have negative holdings of oil, but but in the in the uh, in in the forward market, you can. Yes, that's right. that is important. That's right, and that and that takes some of the pressure off the cash market. You know that you have a more of a two sided market, but that that's right. That's important. Maybe I didn't say that so much on Friday, but it's it. That's one of the reasons why you get this distortion between cash prices and forward prices. Yeah, anyhow, uh, I conclude my words. So, anyhow, I found this place is a great place to get <laughs> new information and a new way of thinking. As I very much appreciate what you guys are doing. Uh, just let me in. Don't kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your feedback. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jung. And just as a as an aside, because many of us have been involved in the Young Scholars Initiative, and obviously we're not so young anymore. Uh, we actually have another nickname, which is the Not So Young Scholars Initiative. So you fit right in. <laughs> um, um, young at heart, the Young at Heart Scholars. Yes, yes, yes. exactly. We we can find new nicknames pretty quickly. Um, we have uh, plenty more questions. Let's um, try to. Keep them brief if possible. Um, I mean, what's next, I believe. Yeah, you can also email me. I'm very, you know, you, it, I'm easy to reach. So I, it, we can, we can take this a little offline. But, but please go ahead, go ahead as the time. Yeah. Great, Perry. After having read your new, new, new book, will I understand the international payment system, in particular the relation of the uh, real time cross. Uh, settlement systems and the central banks. I hope so. Yeah, okay. that's it's a short question. The way I yeah. like it, uh, Karen. Uh, yeah, I have been. I have a number of questions that I think should be illustrated better. Uh, I have taken a few of your co classes, but not that much. Many of them, but I've read a lot of your. I've read two of your books and a lot of your articles, so I think I'm pretty familiar with your thinking. But um, I think that what we miss is a little bit the, the distinction between what is money and the money system. I, I make that decision because distinction because money, what is money? What is the value of money? That is that is really the elephant in the room, I think. What is the relationship between the prices of money and value of money? Is there a relationship or do we discard the notion of value of money entirely? Um, I think you should, you, you, you are a little bit dismissive of the euro, I think, in your way of thinking. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's sort of my impression. Um, and um, I also think that the global system is not completely unified. I, I mean, that's obvious, of course. But in which way is it not? And uh, in which way does that have to do with the hierarchy of, 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 of the institutions? I think that, um, that this, this comes also into the question of, nation, of the nation state as a an economic unit, which is illustrated by the balance of payments. Does a balance of payments mean anything? And for whom does it mean anything? For poor countries, yes, but for you know Denmark, not really. Uh, it's, it's negative, really, to have too too huge a a, a, a surplus. But there's also these are some of the things that I, I would like to see illustrated. And also, I would like you to take a little bit more of a clash with Keynesians and Keynesian thinking, because it's sort of sometimes you quote them here and there, but is there some consistent Keynesian thinking on money? 
Uh, I'd like to sort of have a criticism of that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, so I think um, just making sure that those are hands are, that are currently up are still questions or not, Mohammed. I have um, a couple thoughts too, um, if you allow me. Um, so what, number one, um, what I think is absolutely critical is, uh, and, the, and the key contribution obviously that you start from is, I, I think you do this, but it's not so clear from your lecture today, Perry, is to sort of start very sol solidly with the, the key the key conceptual ideas, with the sur survival constraint and the time, all the things we talked about that are sort of brushed aside in, uh, in, in, other, in other concepts. Uh, so that's, that's fine. I think obviously you're going to do that in the book, but I think it's super clear to sort of say this is the ultimate focus of, of the money view. And obviously other things are, are then out of focus more, but I think it's so critical because it's sort of not really in focus in any other perspective the way that you have it. And it is the critical question for a lot of the financial crisis we have. So, um, and and with and with that, uh, I I love the language you introduce. Uh, I, I think the 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 key the key question for me would be how do we get more entryways for all the the, the different audiences into into the into the group um, into the into the money view. So one um, maybe ex we explain relevance better. So I think one of the first lectures you talk about financial globalization, and I think that's a, a great hook. Because everybody was concerned about globalization, but mostly on other fronts. Um, but here, financial globalization and explaining the logic of why, uh, and I think that was the, uh, a great contribution of the MOOC of the first lectures. What, why, why do we have this sort of uh, this big money market, um, and what is our positionality? Um, I think, in addition to the hierarchy, I think the hierarchy of agents and the hierarchy of ac um, market actors and dealers was was a super critical part because I think. Um, doing a great job of that would actually give us a better perspective of where we are vis-a-vis -vis the system. And some visual aids in terms of data, I think the, the showing the size of different markets and how they're not talked about in other conversations at all, Keynesian or mainstream or whatever, uh, like I'm talking about the repo market or the foreign exchange market or other capital markets with the size of these markets and how they're sort of a blank spot because we just don't see and, and that they're all in dollars and why and 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 so this logic, I think, will give us an entry point and maybe more appreciation um, for why uh, different different theories, if you're coming from conceptual perspective, why they're engaging with this critically or not at all as a mainstream, um, and uh, and why there is sort of a logic here of also financial development uh, or cycles. I think you also don't talk about cycles very much, but now that I heard Schumpeter, I think your concepts of of uh, discipline and elasticity are also can, could be applied to cycles uh, and bring the cycles into the uh, into the inside and outside spread logic um, a, a bit more. I think that connects up to more other literature that we have there. Um, the I think conceptually and didactically, it's super important to what you do to take different co conversations and different discourses and actually show which money view concept directly applies and speaks to that. Um, if it's, if it's, um, if it's, say, let's, let's, for example, say, what is the big question of financial development? It's, it's, let's say capital scarcity. Um, then, then you can sort of directly in a very, in, in this book, perhaps have a, a very clear discourse about what is the key thing that, 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 that a different agent is facing or a country is facing or, um, in, in, in that perspective. And, uh, and for example, the money view would obviously say, in a, in a, from a Kindlebergian perspective, that you're trying to uh, integrate into the global capital market. It makes no sense to, to, to Karen's perspective. Why is Perry dismissive of the, of the euro? Because obviously now you're building many different capital markets in the world that are not that are actually in competition to each other. And there's a from a money view a logic that is Kindlebergian. There's one unified market uh, that is actually emergent from practice. Um, and the practice perspective is also, I think, key. I think we have to sort of engage a little bit more with this this problem of that um, you're viewed as endorsing or um, being sympathetic uh, to uh, imperialism, monetary imperialism and, mon and, 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 and dollar hegemony and dominance and all these concepts. Um, I think there would be 
there has to be a good way to neutralize that and make it a more neutral statement what we're doing and not be so enthusiastic about the developments because there are uh, very clear problems for people in the global south to integrate with the system and trade-offs. I think this discussion can be done in a very coherent way in the application side, but I think there are, there are. Um, I think it's, it is, uh, to my first point, when you have the positionality of all the different agents and even including ourselves, it's pretty clear we don't know what the money market is. We don't see this capital market. We don't, we don't engage as a retail person or as a as a as a as a critical scholar or whoever. We don't. We see this from the outside, but there's a lot of stuff happening on the inside, and very few uh, concept, very few theories really engage with the internal logic and the and the the, the logic of how these things emerge, uh, and and what the what the thrust of this development is. Um, and these things are going to happen. From practice, whether we like it or not, and policy has only so much to say about this. Uh, I think the policy space is also an interesting thing. You always talk about from a Minsky and you know, from from a from a from a money view perspective, it's more or less blessing something that's already emerging from practice. It's not so much designing it from the state perspective, and that's more more the case in a globalization regime, uh, more so ever there uh, rather than than in a uh, classic sort of uh, nation state regime that we've uh, long ago uh, been been out of the question. So I think engaging this question more head on, I think is critical because I think we're all still nation state logic. We're all struggling with global governance questions. And this is a very new take on what, what do we do about this global phenomena that is not no longer being able to con be controlled in the ways we typically think from all perspectives. There's very few, except for the BIS, groups that really think about this globalization phenomena in the way that we have, especially also not from a globalization from financial perspective. I think this is also not dealt with in a proper way. So I think there's a lot of explaining to do, and there's a lot of uh, non-conversations that are happening as a consequence, uh, and I think the money is critically important. Anyway, so I've just given you a whole bunch of things. Um, we're at time, but I think if we're fine, um, I would just give you a chance to respond, Perry, for a couple more minutes, and I think if... Yakov is here. He'll excuse us for uh, cutting into his time. I don't even see him here yet. Um, so there's a lot of things here, but I think the maybe the biggest thing is the question about in what sense am I trying to do social theory? That also came up of you know how, what is the connection with critical theory? Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what critical theory means. I know that in social science conversations they use that word. Um, and 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 hegemony. So one of my next things is to is to write about hegemony um, and the word hegemonic stability theory and political science. They all claim that this is what Kindleberger contributed, and he never used that word. Okay, and it's in, it's a misinterpretation. So one of my attempts to solve this problem that people see me as a hegemon, okay, is to in fact correct the record about Kindleberger a little bit too and go back in the political science literature and 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 to, to do that. Um, but as a social science more generally, you may remember in the last couple of days we heard Anoush, okay, who is not an economist, you know, and he is basically doing he's an anthropologist by training. Um, and uh, doing a political theory of money, um, trying proposing such a thing. Um, he was one of my earliest students, um, and he caught on to something I wrote in 1999, really before the MOOC was even even very much far far along. Um, and uh, and you heard uh, Nielsen, who was another one of my students, who's taken it in a different direction. You've heard Katerina, who who's a lawyer, okay, and is feeling like we're 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 in some ways, collaborators or complementary. Um, you've uh, Adam Tooze was another person who who I so history history people Stefan's work. You know, so there are there are many. They all have made me aware that this money view is useful um, for thinking about other problems than how exactly does the international settlement system work? <laughs> as important as that is, Armin, you know, I think it's actually, there's a lot of, 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 uh, you know, there, there's a lot of, of wisdom in the details, you know, when you actually understand how these things work, you know, you, you learn something deep about the world. Okay. That it's not just, 
back office clerical things that we should leave to minions, you know, um, and that the there are actually economics here. There's actually some important economics here. And uh, so the survival constraint, the settlement constraint is basically nowhere in economics. Um, and uh, nor really is the dealer function. You know, you're always imagining that supply and demand are, are meeting and there's a price that's being determined there and the dealer is not in between them. But in the real world, all of these things are there. So it is, I, I think that's right, that it is not that I'm, these are, these, are, these are things that are new in economics. They add to economics, okay? But they do make you then think about the existing economics in a different way. Okay. And you realize that they are missing, that, that the economics is abstracting from things that are actually very important in the real world. Um, and so therefore they aren't that you can't see them. You know, that this was Katerina's point about the when 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 the Soviet Union, you know, decided that it wanted to be a market economy, you know, their economists were completely useless in helping them think about what is the right infrastructure for this new world you're trying to build okay um and i think money viewers would have been more useful okay in that in that time um because you have some notion of of the role of the monetary infrastructure in 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 running in running things um and uh you know they developed a monetary infrastructure of course we heard we heard about the central banker in 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 russia um over time but in the meanwhile, they missed an opportunity, and there was a lot of you know, oligarchs and stealing and stuff like that. That that was enabled by the fact that there were no controls, um, and that had a long his you know had consequences, social consequences, uh, for for the future of of Russia and therefore the future of the world because it's an important country. Um, so let me maybe just stop there. Um, and uh, uh, we have one good piece of news. Our next speaker is not here yet, so there is no constraint to end the session. And I feel oh, there's a lot of things still there. That's that's worrisome news. I hope he's okay. I assume it's nothing serious. Um, okay. So, but uh, I would like to. There, are, there were a lot of hands up. I know that. Jorge okay, so I'm happy to hear hear more. Let me just see if I had any other. So I was mainly trying to respond, you know, the the fact that the MOOC, which was an upper level economics elective, right, that it people took it in all kinds of different directions has has made me interested in following some of this and incorporating some of these things in in my own. And I was trained as a general social scientist. I was as a, my undergraduate degree. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I've always been a bit of a fish out of water in economics, because I was not properly socialized as a young person. Um, and I always thought economics should be a social science. Um, and uh, that turned out to be a minority view. Um, so the, uh, uh, let me just see. Now that that's, so, so particularly Mohammed, I want to answer you. Starting with the global <laughs> is very much starting with hierarchy, with the international hierarchy of money. Um, that, that one image that I flipped by maybe too fast for you, okay, um, that the global system is itself hierarchical. Now, that's, you know, that's a, a positive statement. That's like, how is the world organized? Okay. Now, I guess the normative question then is, what should we do about that? You know, um, should it be more equal? Is it possible to make it more equal? What, in what sense do we mean equal? You know, um, uh, what, uh, but the, what way, how do countries that are at the bottom of this hierarchy interface with that system? What is their, what is their room for maneuver? Um, and uh, the, I mean, I was very interested in this, in this talk we just had about, about Pakistan, you know, and hearing, you know, this reminded me of the way that, you know, many, many, many of the, the, the elites in the global South they do their banking in New York, you know, so they're not actually exposed to the vicissitudes of what's happening in their own economy. And, and yet they're running the show in these countries. So that's sort of what's emerging in Pakistan, you know, except that they're not banking in New York, they're banking in Tether, you know. And so they're so those are the kinds of of issues that arise when you start to see the global system as 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 hierarchical to begin with, and let's not 
you know, have ISLMBP, some notion that there's a theory of foreign exchange that applies everywhere, you know, that, it, that all countries are kind of the same, that the system is flat. It is not flat. It is not flat. And the problems and resources of different countries are very different from each other. Um, and the problems of, of the of, at the apex are quite different from the problems of Europe, you know, which is one level down, um, and or or Japan. Um, so there there are there has to be different. Uh, this levels thing, even you know, on Friday I was talking about the theory of the price level. We need three theories of the price level <laughs> for you know for the the inside spread economy the outside spread economy and the breakdown economy so i i think there's more of that we need in economics instead of oh we have one theory for everything and it's like one curve slopes up and one curve slopes down you know i think not i think not but here i'm going to hear more if 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 yeah. uh, jacob is not here yet if other people are interested in sharing so, so Sam keeps asking a question in the chat. He says, oh, what paper or book have you seen that does the best job presenting foreign exchange transactions using balance sheets? <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. That's why I am. And that's probably why Armin asked the question. He wants yeah. me to write it. <laughs> and then Sam, Sam asked if he yeah. was asking a dumb question. And I said, no, he's just yeah. asking a question nobody has the answer to. Um, yeah. But I do have a few comments on what yeah. you said about the book idea. Um I think it's okay to make the book about teaching people how to think in balance sheets. I think that's a really useful um, aspect of the money view, or at least to start there. Because once people are thinking in balance sheets, it gets a lot easier to explain other things. And maybe the same would be true of uh, the trainer model. Um, I noticed that in the Warsaw lectures, you start with why is money difficult? And I think balance sheets can be used to illustrate that, like alchemy. You can show the swap of values in balance sheets. It's like you can't deny it once you see it in the balance sheet. Um, so I don't want you to, I, I don't think you're at risk of doing this, but I don't want you to underplay balance sheets uh, in the book. Um, uh, I like the idea of um, starting by kind of with the survival constraint, starting with liquidity, um, and then how it connects up to balance sheets on the trainer model. So kind of showing the difference between solvency and liquidity. You do this in the MOOC, and I think it's fantastic, and I don't want to see it go away. Um, but then also kind of having the trainer model in there right away, saying like, well, this is kind of where liquidity comes from, the market makers. So really kind of they're both, both of those pillars are kind of connected uh, to liquidity and the survival constraint. Um, I like your idea of being global from the beginning. I think that's fantastic. I tried to do that a little bit with the MOOC this year, but then, you know, at the beginning of the first lecture, I've tried to, you know, say, oh, this also applies to global flows and payments or whatever, but I kind of, uh, that tailed off after a little while. Um, I don't, I, I'm a little bit worried about picking fights. Um, if you were picking fights back when you made the MOOC, I don't know if I ever would have come on board. Um, I, I think, it's useful to um, to be orthogonal to the extent that you can, um, but it's also useful to be pr provocative. Um, so I don't know the answer on that. I just um, I'm concerned about fights. Yeah, me too. But it doesn't uh -huh. have to. Just to put on this last point, I think it's important. I don't think we need to engage in fights, but I think what what we've been doing this weekend is to open categories that are that are, we're not having fights on the terms of of what people are have been de debating, right? We're not talking, we're not, for example, because I talked about this economic development thing, it's not having a fight to say, hey, uh, it's the US's fault that the world is not developing or something like that, right? Um, or it's, or, or, you know, from the global South perspective or some, or framing the development question in a completely different way from in a mainstream perspective. I think it's just saying, if you think about it, if you take the system from this as, as it is, there's another way to think about the development problem. There's another, uh, another unused uh, canvas of possibility to, st to step into and it might be much more promising because that's where actually action is happening there's a lot of interest and that's where actually the, pr the private sector is acting or or people are the, the Bridgetown initiative is acting on those principles for example how to finance global south development projects through this logic of the money view if you will and that is taken seriously by policymakers but the academics are completely outside of that, that conversation um, so that's just I think it's not necessarily about fighting directly something, but it's just saying, hey, sidestep the problem and open up the space, but give connected tissue from these people into the space, right? Give them a, an onboard 
into the conversation. If it's happening completely outside of the conversation, it's also not helpful. Then we, we need to have onboarding conversations. So that was just my side. I agree with the, the point. We shouldn't attack people for no reason because we should give them a chance to, to come into the conversation, right? That's the, that's the, the, the goal here. Yes, Especially. I'm not, I'm not interested in, I, what I, what I meant, it's not, so, maybe I say, I use the word picking fights because I'm, no, but I'm, didn't say that, but I'm, a, I'm anticipating point. that some of the things that I want to say in this book are things that people have strong views upon about um, that I think are wrong. And so I, I have avoided, you know, I've avoided pointing out ways in which this framework will cause trouble for you, you know, if you, if you want to stay where you are in your, it, it, that it, that it's, you, you can't really use ISLM. You can't, you, it's not going to work. You know, you, you can't have both, you can't have both of these things. So it's not just orthogonal. Um, that it it actually it actually is is different, um, and uh, and I and I want to make that clear, particularly to you know to graduate students who are trying to uh, you know build their own toolbox and and build their own future. You know that just as so that they they realize that there's something you can do. This is what I used to do at Columbia. You know, the graduates, the reason Anush came to me, the reason Dan Nielsen came to me is they took standard macro classes and they found that they didn't help them understand the world. And so they then came and said, can I be your TA? <laughs> you know, you seem to know something about the world that, uh, that I want to know. And I want to know how to do what you're doing. And so that's what I want to do, okay, is be a resource for people like that who then can uh, and make it clearer that, that you can do that. You know, if you start from here, you have you will have something new to say. And that's exactly what graduate students need, right? You have to have some something new to say. Um, otherwise, there's no point, you know, but there's always something new to say when you start from the money view. Okay. Because it's a new starting point. And so that's that's part of the point. That it will be new and therefore it will be controversial. Um there, but you somebody mentioned it won't be controversial. You should be you should be assured of this that it's I'm not particularly, you know, as opposed to many of the self-described heterodox economists, I don't feel myself to be a heterodox economist, okay? Because what I what I believe about the world is what bankers believe about the world. You know, there it's natural point of view for people who are in banks or in central banks or at the BIS. It's it's so in what sense can it be heterodox? You know, it seems like it has a natural uh, constituency. So I just make it sharper. I, I make it analytically clean so that you can teach it to people who ha don't have any banking experience. You know, bankers learn this as rules of thumb, but it's not, it's what Badgett said, you know, that, that the men, the practical bankers know stuff about the world, but they haven't written down. They haven't done the theorizing. Okay. And the theorists don't know anything about the world. And so that's the problem. So I'm trying to be that bridge person um and uh so that i can understand what the bankers are saying even when they're not talking economics you know and i can translate it using the money view um that's that's a lot i just want to translate more okay and not and not and not be and and point out how it how it connects and I think it is true about, you know, the, the politics of financial globalization are what everyone is concerned about. That's why the sociologists want to learn finance. That's why the anthrop that's why they all want to learn finance, because they know, you know, that 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 the global system seems to have a logic of its own. The nation state seems to be less of a relevant political entity than it was at right immediately after World War II. But what how should we think about that? You know, and some people want to think about that. Well, we need to go for deglobalization. We need to tear it all down. Okay, or how sh if people are trying to figure out how to think about that, and I think the money view helps you think about that. I, we truly appreciate that, Perry. I think that is yeah. that, that is a, a real strength of the money view is to bridge uh, into different places and extend. And connect up different different bodies of knowledge that exist already. I think that's why we're all here in, in some way because we I, can. So in my class, I'll say one more thing because I because of the global south dimension, 
Um, so in my classes, I still start with the Financial Times, you know, and, and some article from from today's news. Um, and I get pushback from that from my students here at BU. It's like you're you're you know you're 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 embedded in this elite conversation. I said, no, I don't think that's the right way to think of it. I'm trying to translate this conversation and make you able to engage with it and hear what the bankers are talking to each other about. So instead of you know, you need to understand how they talk to each other and 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 become a part of that conversation. That's what I'm trying to to enable. Okay, I'm not trying to enable you to talk to people who think exactly like you. You know, that's that's easy. Okay, I'm trying to enable you to talk with people who do not think like you. Okay, and that's that's the challenge. Great. Um... I have some good news, an update. Yaakov uh, is responding to me. Uh, he got the <laughs> time, time's wrong in his, um, I'm not sure, schedule. So he's on his way here, but he needs a couple more minutes. I would say we take the three questions here uh, and okay. then close the session. Maybe four okay. Very quickly. If you all can be very quick, that'd be wonderful. And then we close out the session. Thank you much. I think Asko was next. Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to... Uh, emphasize one point because I, I was teaching this some years ago, yeah, for 2014 to 2019, the course <clears throat> in inside. And I remembered when I don't remember his name, I think from Argentina was telling from his teaching experience early on in the talk that he needed to explain the interbank lending to the students. And, and uh, I needed to do that also. You know, even though the reading was there on the MOOC, um, so so that's I think a, a point to emphasize to have early on in the book or in an appendix the explanation of the balance sheet approach and with bank balance sheet expansion and bank interaction with two banks or something like that. So, so I only wanted to okay keep in mind. Great. I think, um, Diego, you were already, let's, let's jump you, you come at the end. Kiko was already as well, so Larissa gets the first dibs. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so I, th I guess in my work, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, the bank business models, competitive dynamics, and I think, you know, the Money View has been incredibly helpful in thinking about that. I think one that I'd be interested to see if you've seen developed or is in the plans is more around like what the like dealer profitability and what that might mean for different institutional models or dealer business models. Um, so I think that there's this broader conversation about competition between banks and non-banks and different types of dealers. So that's something that I'm trying to get my head around as well as different ways that which financial market infrastructures are evolving to change who has access um, and even how they function, which will have an impact to um, to dealer models and profitability. Uh, so that's just like the general umbrella of, of questions that would be great to have more people thinking about. Yeah, I saw in the chat you were you were um, mentioning about, you know, at atomic settlement and that that sort of thing, you know, there there does seem to be some notion that you can squeeze all the credit out of the payment system, and so uh, liquidity should be free. Yeah, the and so engaging with that, you know, directly, I think is important. Okay, because I think it's not true, <laughs> and it's um and and you're you it will make the system more fragile actually. Um, the so where you inventories are there for a reason, you know, so. Um, and they they do something. They're not just inefficiencies. And the uh, and credit is there for a reason, you know. So you're you're yeah, the uh, but but I think that it's hard to see that when you're starting from you know Valrasian general equilibrium, you know, where it doesn't have any money in it at all. So you, you don't. It's hard to see that. Um, and so I don't start there. 